Well, good afternoon and uh, good morning, everyone, depending on where you are in the country. And, uh, and welcome to Miller Thompson's webinar on Paths Forward in Financially Troubled Times for Charities and Nonprofit Organizations. Uh, it's great to see a lot of familiar names and faces, uh, at least on screen. And we hope that everyone is, is doing well after what's certainly been a challenging 18 months. My name is Andrew Valentine. I'm a partner in the Social Impact Group at Miller Thompson, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Before I introduce our panelists, uh, I have a few housekeeping items. We do have a significant number of participants today, which is great. Uh, and I wanna remind you that everyone's been placed on mute mode uh, during the presentation so that everyone can hear clearly. Uh, the webinar today is being recorded and the recording link will be provided to you uh, a few days after, after the webinar. If you do have any questions during the presentation and we do want to encourage you to, to ask them, please feel free to submit these through the chat box. Uh, we have planned some time following the presentation for Q&A and we're going to do our best to answer all of your questions at that time. In case we don't have enough time for all of your questions, We'll be glad to connect with you via email after the webinar. During the Q&A por uh, portion of the webinar, you will also have the opportunity to complete uh, a survey where you can provide us with suggestions for future topics, as well as any overall feedback that you have. Uh, we always appreciate your input so that we can make these sessions as useful as possible. And finally, uh, and I expect that we all appreciate this, but I wanna remind everyone that this presentation is being offered as information and not as legal advice. We're pleased to provide uh, comments and a survey of, of various legal issues, but it's of course important that every organization get legal advice that's specific to the organization and, and to your unique circumstances. So with that, let's turn to the substance of the webinar today. Our discussion today flows from a report that was released in December by the Matart Foundation in collaboration with Miller Thompson. Uh, the report was called Paths Forward in Financially Troubled Times, a Restructuring and Insolvency Guidebook for Charities and Nonprofit Organization. And the guidebook focused on issues to consider and options that are available to charities and nonprofits that are dealing with challenges to their financial sustainability. And the report laid out a number of avenues that organizations can explore if they are experiencing financial troubles. And this can include continuing operations in a different legal form, uh, different types of collaborations, changes to their finance, as well as restructuring or, or winding up the organization if that's necessary in a prudent and, and reasonable manner. And so we're very happy that the authors of this report are here today to discuss the guidebook and to delve deeper into these issues. Susan Mannering is a partner and the national head of Miller Thompson Social Impact Group. She's a recognized leading expert advising social enterprises, charities, and nonprofits. And she provides both general counsel and specialized tax advice to clients across Canada and internationally. Bob Wyatt is the executive director of the Matart Foundation, which is a 68-year-old private foundation based in Edmonton. The foundation has been a strong supporter of the charitable sector infrastructure for more than 30 years, including by providing resource material like the guidebook that is designed to assist the staff and boards of charities, whatever their area of work. Bob's been very active in issues related to the regulation of charities and has served on a variety of boards and committees. And finally, Craig Mills is a partner with Miller Thompson. He's a commercial litigator with a focus on commercial disputes, creditors remedies, insolvency law and franchise law. Working with Miller Thompson's insolvency lawyers across Canada, Craig's litigation background has proven to be a valuable tool in strategically advising clients on commercial debt enforcement and recovery, restructuring and insolvency matters, litigation and claims resolution management. So the first question I'll ask to Bob, and it's really about the context in which the guidebook was written. Bob, you've worked in the sector for a number of years and you've certainly seen a lot. You've seen the sector evolve and be impacted by different events. The preface to the guidebook says that we really are living in unprecedented times. I'm wondering if you can tell us you know, why you feel that statement is appropriate and what message you want the sector to remember when they're considering these issues. 
Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, the when when this whole thing started, if you take your mind back to the middle of March of, of 2020, when we all thought this was maybe a two or three month thing that we were going to have to somehow survive, you could not see a politician or a health official uh, speak without them using the word unprecedented. And I think many of us were getting quite sick of it by uh, by the, the time it was over. Um, but in retrospect, it truly was. I mean, we, we many of us will remember Y2K, which was going to be the end of civilization as we knew it. Um, we, we lived through the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009. We lived through the SARS epidemic and the threat of, of avian flu. Um, but never before has the sector essentially had to shut down because the whole world shut down. Nobody had ever had to think about being able to deliver services only virtually. I mean, even if they had the technology, they didn't know how to use it. I mean, two years ago, most of us had never heard of Zoom. Many of us are looking forward to perhaps two years from now, never having to hear the word Zoom again. Um, so it, it really has been a, an experience that we could not have foreseen and that we could not have planned for. And I guess that in the, in the opening of the guidebook, what we wanted to do was say to people, this isn't your fault. I mean, if you're, if you're in trouble, if you're, if you're having questions about whether you can or even want to continue, that's okay. You're not alone. There are resources that can help you, but you could not have planned for this. I mean, I, I've facilitated a number of strategic planning sessions lived through a hell of a lot more strategic planning sessions than anyone should ever have to go through. And whenever you're talking about risks or threats, nobody ever thought saying, oh, one of the risks is the whole world's going to shut down for 18 months. And we're going to have politicians who are trying to figure out on the fly what to do. So this is new territory for all of us. Thankfully, a number of the, the tools and resources that we may be able to use to continue to serve people are around. We just have to know about them and know when to utilize them. Thanks, Bob. And so, Susan, um, you know, in, in, in light of this context and you know, the challenges that, that many organizations are future of, of the situation, can you summarize a bit for the audience to sort of what the guidebook is trying to do and how it's intended to assist organizations that are in this situation? Um, thanks, Andrew, Andrew, and sure. And I and it really does follow up on what Bob has been saying. I think um, many of us, and good afternoon all, um, or good morning, depending on where you are, um, many of us realize, know a lot about the charity world or know a lot about the rules and have heard a lot about that. But um, as Bob said, I mean, this is an area where most of us are probably not as familiar with the rules, need some understanding and some um, familiarity with what's out there, what's possible, um, because it, it, these are really different times than we've had to face before. And so I think when we, we first started talking about this and, and what was gonna happen in the sector, um, Bob and I were, were sort of thinking, well, we need to put a tool out to the, into the sector so people understand they can and, and can read something that either, you know, summarizes what the indicators might be that you need to look for to see that you might want to take steps because you're having some financial issues, understand that there are um, mechanisms available, which Craig is more familiar with than, than some of us, but that are there to help organizations survive. They're not there to be penalties. They're not there to be a negative. They're there in order for you to have options to consider. So in the guidebook, we've that's what our focus was on, was A, to try and, as Bob said, make everybody understand this is not our fault. This is not your fault. This is just prudent um, prudent thinking while you're looking at what are the implications of the pandemic on your organization. And then what are the questions to ask? What are the indicators to look for? And then what might be the solutions? And, you know, a lot of the solutions are very enabling. 
there's no doubt that we will likely see as we move forward that some organizations may have to really think hard about what they're going to be doing and, and how they're going to survive. But there's many tools available to ensure that that survival can, that you can be successful in surviving. And we wanted just to have a resource available so that people had a place to go. If you, when you look at the guidebook, you'll see we, we highlight it's available for charities, it's available for nonprofits, we touch on trust, and we even touch on the issue of unincorporated associations. And then we work through the concept of what are you, what should you be looking for? What, what should you be thinking about? What are the options? And then there's a, a section that really describes the, the legal mechanisms, whether it's bankruptcy or creditor protection or just dealing with a creditor. Um, so that will enable you to understand what steps you might take. And then we and then we also talk about potential liabilities and how it works. So it really is an overview. As we said earlier, it's not legal advice itself, but it should set the stage for a good discussion at the man senior management level and at the board level for an organization, no matter where you're at in the system, just to make sure that things are going the way they should and ensure that as you move forward, you are you know when to seek the right input and how to get the right input. So it really is an overview that will hopefully make people feel more comfortable and confident in where they're at instead of, it's not meant to, to cause people to be nervous. Correct. So, so Bob, if I'm on the board uh, or if I'm the CEO of an organization that's that's facing some of these challenges, you know, where, where do I start in thinking about these issues and sort of realizing that you know, the organization may have to go down this path? Well, in your case, Andrew, I would suggest that you contact uh, Miller Thompson and seek help right away. The, uh, I, I think there's a practical answer and, and there's a more philosophical answer. The practical answer is, take a look at your financial statements and, and not just the, for the past, but look at the projections. And, and one of the things that, that I think are, is necessary is when you're, when you're developing projections for what the next six months or the next year is going to be, list what those assumptions are. Because as things change, you may need to go back and say that assumption is no longer valid. So what effect does that have? Um, we have, for example, as things now stand and subject to any change by the federal government, a number of the benefits programs that a number of charities and nonprofits have been relying on are to end this month. Um, that is going to be a huge change and is going to have a major impact on finances. We're already seeing um, a standard statement on most financial statements by most auditing firms about COVID um, and, and some of them are being put on in addition to a going concern note. So if those things are happening, if, you're, if your accountant, your auditor are starting to say, look, um, the numbers aren't looking all that positive, you need to figure out whether to wait until disaster strikes or whether, as is more appropriate, and Craig can talk to this, plan early know what your options are, know what, know what the potential is. The more philosophical answer is it's time for CEOs and boards to have those tough conversations about do we want to continue and can we continue? And one of the things that I'm, I'm seeing, particularly in, in um, rural areas where we know that there's a small group of people who manage a number of charities and, and nonprofits, people are tired. Uh, this, this pivoting, as we've called it, um, has exhausted a number of people. Um, and, and those of us who get our energy from being with others are finding this particularly difficult. So one of the things to have an honest conversation about is do we even want to continue? Because if the answer is no, then you need to start planning on what you're going to do with employees, what you're going to do with clients. How are you going to ensure that, that you can celebrate the legacy of everything you have done up to this point? So there are warning signs, and, and Craig can talk more about, about those warning signs, but it's also time for really tough conversations um, that we perhaps in the sector 
tend to delay more often than, than we should. So then maybe we'll, we'll turn to Craig uh, to follow on that. Uh, you know, Craig, Craig, what are some of these warning signs and, and indicators that organizations should be looking for that may indicate that they're not necessarily going to be financially sustainable? Thanks, Andrew. Uh, and thank you to everyone for attending today. Uh, usually when I get involved, I'll, I'll tell you, it's usually the worst case scenario. Uh, a company has received a notice from a creditor, perhaps even a statement of claim, uh, or worse, there's been uh, an insolvency of a service provider that uh, directly impacts your business. Uh, so oftentimes we are in emergency mode and, and having to deal with it. Uh, however, uh, that's why we have the guidebook to help you hopefully avoid those types of circumstances. Not everything, but uh, most. The, the things that uh, you would look for are, uh, I would start with the obvious. Are, are you getting notices from uh, your suppliers and vendors uh, that payments are past due? Uh, are you uh, dealing with issues uh, uh, in terms of um, having to come up with uh, uh, appropriate funds for your landlord uh, and having to constantly uh, figure out how you're going to rob Peter to pay Paul? Those are the obvious ones. Uh, but obviously from an accounting perspective, and I don't profess to be an accountant, but uh, the analysis that typically uh, an insolvency practitioner, uh, and by that I mean a trustee, and I'll, I'll comment on that in a moment, would do is uh, in conjunction with an accountant uh, for your organization, for instance, you look at your uh, cash flow, uh, and Bob mentioned doing the forecasting and, and assessing uh, your current revenue streams, uh, the grants, the uh, income generated by the business, and uh, and funding uh, from uh, charitable uh, donations, things like that. Uh, and look at that versus your expenses. And using that plus your reasonable forecasts, are you going to be able to meet your current and your future obligations in a reasonable way? Uh, or alternatively, look at it from a balance sheet analysis to your assets. Uh, uh, are your assets more valuable than uh, your liabilities or is it vice versa? Uh, so from those basic things that you look at, you determine whether or not uh, you have to make some changes within the organization and how it's structured and what you uh, are consuming uh, your funds with. Uh, and you also look at <clears throat> what you have for the future. Uh, is there property, for instance, that, uh, for instance, could be rented out or uh, sold, things like that. So you, you start looking at those sorts of things as being the indicators of where you're at right now and where you could be in the future, uh, making those reasonable uh, determinations of where your, your uh, cash flow may be headed. Uh, and where you have a more immediate uh, concern, try and deal with it right away. Uh, my recommendation is get outside advice, get uh, the advice of your accountant, number one, figure out if you have a good and solid uh, foundation for an assessment of your financial uh, perspective, and then you make those decisions. So th those would be the, the things that I look for first and foremost, and obviously the ones that are most important you deal with uh, as soon as possible. Right. So Susan, after an organization has gone through you know, the kind of self-analysis, both financial and philosophical that, that Bob and Craig have, have outlined, and if it determines that you know, it, it may be facing financial difficulties and it needs to think about some of the options that the guidebook talks about, you know, what, what are these options, at least, at least at a high level? Thanks, Andrew. And I, I think, um, you know, I think just to reiterate a little bit what Craig and Bob have both said, I think this this issue of analysis and figuring out what it is that you should do or when you should act. I mean, I would encourage all organizations to be doing that right now, even though, I mean, as, as Craig said, you don't wanna be asking these questions at the time where you're in a serious situation. You wanna to try to be starting. So, um, and, and an, another area to think about and look at is where does your funding come from and is it going to be sustainable? So today you might have funding, you might have your funders, you might have your donors, you may know that the next six months or the next year are okay, but think about where that funding source is coming. Who's paying the fees for your services? That sort of thing. Because that also might feed into the things that Craig was talking about and cause you to go, okay, maybe we need to think about that particular program, which may not be as sustainable into the future, or this where maybe we need to consolidate things. And that's, that's where we start 
taking that analysis, if everybody's doing it and then going, okay, what is it we want to see for the future? Do we want to be, do we want to remain our own organization? If we're thinking that, you know, some of our funding is going to go away and the services we provide cannot um, be provided without some of that funding, is there a possible merger or a possible joint um, project or venture you do with another organization? Um, there's a lot of organizations or a lot of talk about duplication of services in the sector. Are there mergers or acquisitions or well, not necessarily acquisitions, but mergers are, are coming together that make sense, integrations that allow you to continue because of the consolidation of of um, resources and funding. Um, another thing to think about is streamlining operations. Um, one of the characteristics of, of many organizations who work in community is, is we end up responding to a need and then five years later we look and we're providing you know, 10 different programs sort of around our mission, but they're all slightly different. They're all a little bit, they're definitely achieving a need, but maybe that doesn't make sense. Maybe the board needs to think about, okay, if we streamline our operations, focus our funding in one area, we'll be more effective and we'll be able to survive because it will enable us to cut some costs, some different um, costs or expenses out of our operations. Think about the changes, although I, I, I echo Bob's comment about, I won't be too sad if Zoom goes away. I know it's also enabled us to do things like meet people that we used to talk on the phone all the time. So, um, but, but maybe Zoom has changed how your organization provides services. Maybe remote working or people being able to access service remotely means the way you operate into the future can change. You know, law firms are thinking about whether they need real estate for the future because everybody was able to go home and, and work from home. So the, this is the opportunity to sort of think through what kind of changes can you consider, even if you don't aren't 100% in the situation you need to, but what kind of changes might be smart that would allow you to be more economically sound and sustainable for the future. Um, Another area that we see has, you know, there's been pressure in 2008 and beyond there was pressure and then it sort of goes away and comes back is, is shared services. So there are a lot of organizations that do similar work. There are a lot of organizations that have IT departments, that have payroll departments, that have administration. Is If you're in a community where some of that can be consolidated, and provided to a group of organizations, that can also be a real cost saving measure. And I think that's, that's one of the things that, you know, in the world of, of work and community, we find that people are so busy, they're spending so much time just delivering the mission they, they want to deliver, the, to do the work, that they often don't take that time to step back and say, are we doing it efficiently? Are we doing it as cost effectively as we could? And so I think, you know, a real option at this at this juncture is to perhaps, although I know everybody's still really busy, try to stop and, and make that take that consideration and think, you know, maybe there is a merger that would be a, a possibility. Maybe there are some people we can share services with. Maybe we should restructure. You know, a restructure doesn't have to be bad. We might be able to find a way to reconfigure how we're working. Um, there are some going to be if you get to the to the emergency place that uh, Craig was talking about and you need some real assistance, there will be things like, uh, you know, ways to deal with your creditors. If there is bankruptcy, which isn't a is there to be a relieving measure, not to be a bad measure. You're supposed to be able to deal with your creditors and then come out of it and continue to operate. So there are options out there that you can consider. But I think, you know, in the in the in the now of starting to recognize some of the signs, it really is the sort of that business planning, trying to figure out if there's streamlining we can do. Is there a partner or is there an integration? Does it make sense to look at our staffing and figure out how we're doing things? How, can we share costs for operations? Those are um steps you can take to really improve your sustainability or your financial situation going forward. 
So, and, and we go through those in the guidebook and in addition to other suggestions as well. So Craig, turning to the question of you know, the different types of, of creditors that an organization may have and may have to deal with, you know, do you have any recommendations on the different types of creditors that, a, that an organization may have and how to deal with them? You know, what are the options available? Are there any tips and traps that you've, that you've seen and you can share you know, in, in the work that you've done with organizations that are, that are dealing with these types of challenges? Sure. Uh, I mean, I guess the first message I will uh, convey to everyone is don't ignore them uh, and, and hope that they'll go away. Obviously, uh, everyone knows that in principle, but uh, I, I find that almost everybody that I deal with has ignored a creditor and it's become urgent. So I think if, uh, and I'll get into some of them in a moment, but I think if uh, you can approach it from how can I deal with this particular uh, creditor in, in a reasonable way, uh, sooner rather than later, that's always going to be the best situation for you uh, and avoid having you uh, coming to meet with someone like me uh, in an emergency situation. Uh, but to boil down to or look at some of the specific types of creditors, uh, I think uh, for most organizations that may be on this uh, Zoom call, you're going to have suppliers and vendors, number one is one category. You're going to have perhaps a landlord for your lease premises uh, and a lender. Uh, so those are the ones I sort of plucked out from various uh, meetings and so on that I think might be typical. Uh, and starting with the suppliers and vendors, uh, now we're 18 months in. Uh, things are slightly different now, uh, but I, I think the analysis still applies. At the very beginning, everyone was in the same boat. Everyone was in the same predicament on both sides of the equation. So I think there was uh, a greater level of understanding. Uh, and therefore, you were more able to uh, uh, make a bargain with your uh, supplier or vendor, for instance, uh, in a way that worked for you. So what we uh, suggested to clients at the time was you approach that party and, and try and uh, work out uh, different terms of payment, for instance. So if you have significant arrears, can we work out a payment plan where we eat away at that large sum in smaller payments uh, on a monthly basis, for instance? Can we uh, reduce the, the rate of interest that's being charged on whatever that amount is? Uh, can we uh, spread out the term in a better way or reduce the monthly payments? Something that can help you from a cash flow uh, approach that will also benefit the vendor. So you basically have to present it in a way that helps that party who also has debts and obligations to meet and maybe facing similar circumstances. So it has to be approached from a win-win perspective. Uh, to the best way that you can. Uh, so if you can be in that position where you're early and not when they're banging on the drum demanding payment uh, because it's $100,000 in debt, just to give you an extreme example, uh, the better. Uh, in, in terms of your lender, I, I think that's a very similar approach. Uh, now, if you're dealing with a, a lender such as a bank, uh, I, I would suggest that depending on your situation, uh, it may be wise to involve an insolvency practitioner, which is what I mentioned before. And what I mean by that is someone who has the, de the designation uh, of a licensed insolvency trustee, not because you're going to begin any kind of formal bankruptcy process, but because of the skill set that those individuals bring and the relationships that they have with almost every national uh, banking institution. And the reason I suggest that is they can help you devise a presentation and a plan to present to your lender. Uh, that will be better received, I think, than just going in on your own. I think if you have the benefit of a professional uh, with, with whom this bank works and trusts and feels that their, their uh, interests are going to be looked after from both sides of the equation, I think that gives you a leg up. And uh, you will benefit from the presentation uh, that the practitioner can help you with because they will know what it is that, that bank is looking for. Uh, and if you can come up with a plan uh, for instance, I mentioned earlier, you know, you've got some dormant property that's sitting there and maybe you want to have time uh, to sell that property that would allow you to pay down a significant uh, portion of the loan that's outstanding. So perhaps you come up with a plan, uh, perhaps under the guise, I shouldn't use the word guise, under the umbrella of a forbearance uh, agreement. And a forbearance agreement is basically uh, an agreement, a formal agreement entered into with your lender uh, 
which has terms that can be more beneficial to you as a borrower. So for instance, uh, different payment terms, uh, payment amounts, uh, perhaps a deferral of payments. It, it can be very creative. Uh, and since the pandemic hit, we've been using and employing forbearance agreements for our lender clients and for our borrower clients far more than we ever did before. And banks are more receptive to that because of the, this uh, grand pandemic that we're in the midst of. So I think that if you bring in someone like that uh, trustee uh, or uh, at least a financial uh, professional that can assist you with the presentation, you can be in fair much better than you might on your own. Uh, and then I think I also mentioned landlords. Uh, you can deal with the typical things like asking your landlord for a rent deferral, uh, an abatement or a reduction. Uh, and it, again, it, it, it's creativity that you can bring to bear that will allow uh, your landlord to be uh, able to continue its revenue stream, but also benefit you. So there are many uh, different uh, tools that you can bring into that discussion with the landlord. And again, I hope that's an early discussion. Uh, if you are ending or if you're entering the uh, final portion of the lease term, perhaps you've got eight or nine months and you feel like you can use some uh, you don't need the full space that you have. Uh, you may want to negotiate with the landlord for a surrender of the lease with, with uh, a release in your favor so that there are no further obligations by your organization. And perhaps that lender has other alternate space that's smaller and more appropriate for your situation and help you uh, manage your cash flow. So I think it's, it's a varied approach, but I think those are some of the main things that we have uh, proposed and, and uh, recommended to our clients in those sorts of situations. Uh, I will mention one more thing. Canada Revenue, uh, depending on what kind of organization you have, is going to be your first and foremost concern. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, source deductions, employee source deductions, and HST remittances. Uh, those uh, attract a deemed trust, which is basically a super priority, uh, which gives this particular creditor a leg up over every other creditor that you have. And therefore, I would especially from a director's perspective, ensure that those remittances are being regularly made and properly calculated so that you don't run into issues with CRA because they will leapfrog over all other creditors uh, and uh, obviously create issues for directors in the future. So that's something I would focus your attention upon. And Susan also mentioned in, in looking at the different options uh, that an organization might consider you know, formal or, or informal restructuring options that may be available. Can you talk a little bit about that, Craig? You know, what, what are the options available from an insolvency standpoint and, and what, what are the implications for organizations depending on different paths that they might go down? Sure, uh, I, I will start with this uh, comment first. Uh, the question that's often posed to me, uh, I often get calls from organizations in, in uh, the midst of financial distress and they always ask me, where should I start? Uh, should I start with you? Should I start with uh, an insolvency practitioner that I mentioned before? And I think uh, not to uh, trumpet our own selves too much, but I think you do start with a lawyer uh, who uh, has some uh, expertise in insolvency. I, I appreciate that many organizations may have a lawyer on retainer or perhaps on the board, uh, but I would recommend that you uh, look at the credentials of that lawyer uh, and make sure that they have expertise in uh, insolvency and restructuring. And I, I don't mean to uh, detract from anyone else's expertise, but I just think that it's such a complicated area that your organization would benefit from speaking to someone who has this particular skill set for the reasons uh, of talking about the formal and informal processes that I'm going to talk about. Uh, and the reason I suggest speaking to a lawyer is uh, not only do we have connections with uh, trustees, uh, but we will be able to speak to you in a confidential uh, conversation in which uh, you know, all the, the uh, problems of the organization can be discussed without any uh, fear of it being disclosed to other parties. And that way we can look at things calmly uh, hopefully calmly, uh, from a perspective of trying to figure out what the best way forward is and come up with at least a, a rudimentary plan that we can then uh, present to a trustee for further analysis. Uh, you know, for instance, if there have been 
uh, assets that have disappeared in, in an unexplained way. And I'm sure that doesn't apply to anyone on this call, but that's something you want to uh, make sure that we've canvassed because there's privilege that attaches to the conversations with your lawyer. And you wanna make sure that we can deal with it in a way that doesn't disclose uh, any of these problems uh, to parties that don't enjoy that privilege. But secondly, beyond that discussion, I would recommend speaking to a trustee. Uh, the trustees are the ones that drive the processes that we'll be talking about. Uh, they are the ones that do the financial analysis and will be uh, either the bankruptcy trustee in the worst case scenario, or perhaps a, a proposal uh, administrator, uh, depending on which route is, is recommended as the best approach. So to answer in a long-winded way, here are the things that uh, are, can be considered by an organization. One is you can start from an informal perspective. As I mentioned, you can have those discussions with the creditors and, and see if you can reach your own private deals with the various creditors. Uh, th that would be obviously the best approach and the most, I think, cost-effective approach without having to embark in a, in a formal process. However, if that proves to be unwieldy, and before I move on, you can also consult with a, a licensed trustee at that phase, again, because they can give you the benefit of their years of experience in dealing with creditors of those different categories. And that could be very helpful for coming up with a unified approach. But if the informal approach doesn't work, then the formal processes that could be considered are, everybody knows bankruptcy, uh, which is the catch-all term for insolvency, but bankruptcy is a formal process, which effectively, uh, I would say with a company uh, will and the corporation as an operating concern or as a going concern. All the assets of the business upon filing would transfer over to or vest in a trustee in bankruptcy, now called a licensed insolvency trustee. And that trustee has the task of uh, basically realizing upon those assets and uh, ascertaining who the creditors of the organization are and then distributing the uh, proceeds from its realizations. So that, that's sort of the worst case scenario. However, a better case scenario might be to come up with a restructuring plan. And in most cases, uh, it would be under the ambit of a proposal, capital P proposal, which is a formal process uh, which you would undertake uh, with uh, a licensed insolvency trustee. Uh, there would be a, a stay of proceedings in both a bankruptcy and a proposal, which gives you uh, a level of protection from your creditors and gives you the time to figure out a proposal that could be presented to your creditors and voted upon. And if the majority of the creditors vote in favor of the proposal, uh, and the proposal usually is a, a reduction in the amount that's paid to the various creditors, uh, if there's a majority in favor of that approach, uh, then you then take it to the court to get court approval and hopefully uh, everything goes uh, as planned and it becomes basically a binding agreement uh, between the organization and all creditors, including those who voted against your proposal but the key is getting the majority. So if that's the way you can approach things, I think that's obviously gonna be beneficial because it means the organization can live another day, continue as a coin concern, and hopefully uh, rid itself of some of the financial woes that it had before. And uh, that is both for smaller organizations and for larger organizations. Uh, we, we talked about in the guidebook, the difference between those two, uh, but I think for most cases, it'll be uh, the smaller organizations that would be the ones that would be interested in this kind of approach. So those are things that you can explore with your trustee. Your trustee can look at uh, the different avenues uh, and then you can explore the, the best way forward. We may not be as lawyers involved at that stage. It just depends on which pathway forward you take. And then I guess a question for both, both you, know, you, you and Susan, you know, the, the other option that the, the guidebook does talk about um, is, is the ultimate option of, of sort of winding down and, and dissolving as an organization. Um, can you talk a little bit about this, uh, this option and, and the legal implications that, that go with it? Maybe I'll start with Susan. Thanks, Andrew. And, and um, I mean, I think when we were drafting the guidebook, we, we just realized that this is obviously something that may turn into an option for organizations. And we actually had a conversation um, amongst those of us working on it about what about the board that says, I just want to walk away. I just want to have, I'm done and I don't know what to do. And, you know, there are, uh, there always needs to be recognition that, I mean, the staff, as Bob said earlier, everybody's tired. 
and the boards are volunteers and there is there can be a frustration around it doesn't look like we're going to be able to find a merger partner or figure out a way to keep our costs contained and we're really not sure we can survive and and this part of the book is really i mean it it, it speaks to two things it speaks to what you know when craig said um don't hide from your credit lives if you have an issue address it be you know make sure you're turning your mind to it i think that is equally applies in when we're talking in this scenario whether or about a merger or some kind of restructuring is this don't try to put our heads in the sand and not think about these issues it's really important and and realize that winding up or dissolving may not be a bad idea it may just be the time and and every organization has a lifespan and and then and don't do it by just walking away i mean a wind up or dissolution depending on how you're structured and who you are requires you to talk to your stakeholders to talk to take appropriate steps to complete financial statements to get approvals from you know funders or whoever you've been working with get approval from your members in order to um, properly unwind the activities and to ensure the creditors that are there are dealt with to the best to the best of the of your ability, um, you know, Craig noted the the special priority liabilities like CRA and like for GST and for payroll. Those are things that will follow you if you walk away at the time an organization falls, because they are claims that, that the government legislatively has the ability to go after individuals for, whether they're senior management or directors. Not meant to scare you, because I think if you're in a situation where you realize this is where we have to go, there are ways to ensure that you're protected, but you but it is by managing and dealing with the issues. So it's, um, and you know, and if you are a charity, you have to think through the charity pieces of it, which is what are the assets we have? Do we have endowments? Do we have restricted funds? Where are we going to, um, if we think we really don't see a five-year plan, we may have enough for two years, but we think we should stop before we get into difficulty. How are we going to manage those assets? Who are we going to give them to? Are there other organizations that can continue the programming we want to continue? So I think from a dissolution or a wind up perspective, there are legal steps you have to take. Again, it's an area, as Craig says, you want to be able to get the right legal input on what those steps are. And then you have to really, you know, really have an honest discussion with the board with senior management with the membership as is this the option um, as we as I talked about earlier mergers and integrations or even you know joint joint relationships where you're trying to act with others are not a bad idea um, for some organizations to continue their legacy or transferring programming but it isn't it is something that really I think people should have an honest look at in the context of these questions. And I know, I think Craig, you had some comments because there may be a court appointed liquidator. There could be times where there's something more formal on a wind up or dissolution, I think that you that you would add in here. Yeah, I've had uh, files, not particularly in the charity or not-for-profit space, but we've had instances where um, you, know, you just have shareholders that just don't get along. And so the ultimate uh, plan has been to uh, appoint a liquidator, which we've done under the, uh, uh, in our case, the Ontario Business Corporations Act. Uh, we had court order put a liquidator in place uh, who had basically the same uh, tools that a trustee or a receiver, if you've heard that term, would have to, you know, basically figure out all the assets in the arsenal of the, the business and, and sell them and then distribute them to all creditors in a very court managed process. Uh, and so that could be the ultimate uh, option if that is the fortunate position of the business where they have sufficient assets and um, cash on hand to be able to pay out all of the liabilities of the business. And, and if the decision is, it's just not appropriate to continue now at the stage, we just want to shut it down, then that may be the best way to protect everybody because then it ensures that uh, for instance, the creditors that I mentioned, like CRA and landlords and so on, 
they know that they're dealing with a court officer and it's all being court approved. So if you do it through that kind of process, it may give everyone that feeling of comfort and you would know as a stakeholder that it's being done by uh, someone who, who is basically the eyes and ears of the court. Uh, and in conjunction with that, uh, the company can, once all of the liabilities are paid and all the residual funds are distributed in the proper way, then it could be dissolved. Uh, again, by way of court order, and that brings finality to the, the entity or organization, again, giving you that comfort that it was done properly and, and blessed by the court. So that could be a good thing to consider. And I can see situations where um, community type organizations where there is a disagreement amongst the members or disagreement amongst the individuals who have sort of are, are committed to the to the passion of the organization but can't agree on going forward, where this could be uh, a useful operation. So not like quite a shareholder dispute because nobody has really an interest in the assets, but they have very different thoughts about what the future is, and that is. That is something that we see in in these organ in our organizations in the sector, and I think that is an area where, if there is an avenue that could help work it out in that circumstance, it might be something that we would look to. And, and I'll just add to it again. This is assuming you're in that fortunate situation. If there's a particular asset that uh, different camps feel should be sold in a particular way, uh, and they can't agree then this uh, eliminates the roadblock because then you've got a professional who again will get court approval on how best to sell that particular okay. asset or sell that catalog of whatever it is your organization may hold, whatever. It gives oh. you again, the best way to deal with it. And it's a good idea because there is a lot of um, value in a lot of what organizations do. And there may be, there may be good things that, that, that could be done that parties can agree to. Right. Yeah. So a question for Bob, we've been, we've been talking for, for obvious reasons, mostly about dealing with an organization's creditors, but you know, organizations in this space obviously have staff and other stakeholders, they have donors, they have members, they have beneficiaries that are going to be impacted by the path that the organization takes in different ways. Interested in your thoughts on, on how would, you would manage or, or advise an organization in managing this side of the issue and sort of dealing with these different stakeholders? Sure, and, and I guess one of the things I want to emphasize is, is that th this workbook um, and, and what Susan and Craig and I have been talking about so far is for organizations who are finding themselves suddenly in a crunch. And, and what we've all been telling you, I think, is in a number of cases, you should have been able to see that crunch coming. <laughs> and it's, it's always better to deal with the problem before it becomes a crisis. Problems don't take nearly as much time to fix as crises do, and they're not nearly as expensive. Um, there are organizations which uh, are having the discussions now, and, and Machart has supported some of them in, in this work, saying, you know, it's time for us to go. We, uh, it, it, we, we, don't, we either don't have the energy, we think somebody else can do it, we don't see it being uh, financially viable in, in future. And so there is a need to look at how do you shut down this organization? Um, and, and we worked with um, a group of students from Carlton's program and the master's program in philanthropy and nonprofit leadership. Um, and we asked them to do a workbook to look at the other side of the human side of it, not just the financial crisis. And I'll put the, the link to that, uh, it's on our website. I'll put it in, um, in the chat box. It's called, a It's Time to Go. And it talks about, it provides checklists and tips about who do you need to talk to? You know, there, there are conversations you need to have with funders. Lots of conversations you need to have with staff. There are some tips and there's some, some hard lessons learned. First lesson learned is everybody needs to be singing out of the same hymn book. Um, th this is a, a situation where you cannot have rogue people going off and telling different stories. People need to agree on what the message is and what is to be delivered. 
There are obligations to employees. There are obligations to donors. There's obligations to the clients you were created to serve. And if you're able to, to work with others to make that an easy process for everyone to get the, to the place they need to be, that's always going to be a win-win for people. Um, and, and one of the things that the, the four students, who all of whom are, are practitioners who went back for, uh, for a further degree, one of the things they emphasize is make sure you plan to celebrate the legacy. You know, you're, you're not just um, a fly-by-night shop that opened one month and shut down the next month. You have a history. You have people who have served you. You have served people. Take time to mark that and, and to create legacy initiatives, whether it's it's ensuring that, that the history of the organization is not lost, whether it's um, archiving publications for future use and, and for future study. It could be any number of things. So if people are thinking about shutting down, whether for financial reasons or not, this is a good workbook to, to just read, be aware of some of the, the possibilities and work them into your thinking. Um, it will be different for every organization. Uh, the, you know, there's an old line, when you've seen one charity, you've seen one charity um, because we are all very, very different. So, but there are some generalized tips that should work for most organizations and, and plan. And, and the key thing that they talk about over and over again is communication. In the absence of communication, rumors run wild um, and you want to control the narrative. So there's a number of ideas about how to do that. And it applies even if you're in this financial crisis situation, even while you're talking with Craig and, and with the receiver, you need to be thinking about, um, about who you're going to talk to when. If you're, uh, if you're in a situation of insolvency, those plans should be made in conjunction with your professional advisors uh, because there are risks associated with telling the wrong people the wrong thing at the wrong time. Um, so make sure that that's part of, of your planning process with your professional advisors. But if you've just decided, you know what, this organization may be able to work better or we are going to go to... Um, to an amalgamation, but as part of that, our name will disappear. Don't, don't let that go ignored. Um, make sure there's communication, make sure you celebrate the legacy. Be proud of what you have done. Deciding to close down is not always a sign of failure. What it's a sign of is the world has changed. And, and organizations that were created 50 years ago may not be needed anymore. There may be different issues and people get tired. Uh, and, and I get that. And, and there is nothing worse than, um, than going into a meeting of a board of directors and knowing that everyone around the table is just exhausted, but nobody wants to say it's time to shut her down. So a friend of mine says, Always remember, denial is not just a river in Egypt. <laughs> and I was going to say, like, I think one of the things that, that can also happen when you're in the middle of all this is that um, you may forget about the people who are relying on your organization. So you're having this very inward discussion about, and Bob is saying this, but I'm just going to repeat it in with different words and, and emphasize it is that, you know, you're having that discussion. It's important. It's, it's heart wrenching or it's positive, but it's, it's your, the, the clients or the people you serve or the people who have been your donors. And, you know, and it, and it's true. Don't change your name without telling them because that could, you know, that could be a process. You have to manage that. But also if your services are going to change and there have been people, it's, it's just, it's really important to have that, 
have an, a response, have a, have a way of dealing with those issues as you go, because they are the people who, you know, that's where it become it can become difficult in the community. If you, if you haven't thought through some of those things. And I'm just going to piggyback one thing because of something Susan just said, a number of charities um, have either a very formal or an informal plan giving program. And they, they know that there are some people who have named them in wills. If you're in that situation and your organization um, decides to give up its existence, then make sure you're in touch with those people because otherwise when the will has to be administered, that's right. An issue which is going to cost everybody a lot of money and grief. So, so communication, not only with your current donors, but people who you know have uh, made you the beneficiary of an insurance policy or named you in a will, um, be in touch with them and let them know what's going on. So we want to um, encourage anyone uh, who's, who's joining us today to, to feel free to submit uh, questions. We haven't had any questions yet in, in the chat box, but uh, uh, all of us are, are, are certainly happy to address any issues that you'd like, uh, that you'd like commented upon. And maybe I'll, I'll ask um, a question sort of to the group. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about a lot of different options and uh, a, lot, a lot of different issues. Um, you know, is, is there a kind of, I, I worry a little bit about sort of analysis paralysis and, and you know, thinking about kind of order of operations or, or how, how do you sort of proceed through these various issues? Do you start with the philosophical? Do you start with the financial? How might you advise an organization that's, that's sort of perhaps a bit in the soup with, with some of these challenges? Um, let me let me start and then Susan Craig jump in. If you are in financial crisis, do not have the philosophical discussion off the top. <laughs> As Craig has suggested, deal with the 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 crisis, deal with it quickly, uh, and and deal with it honestly, and get the professional advice you want. Um, what I find is the most common problem in. There, there are a couple of problems. So I'm sometimes asked to come into an organization as a neutral chair um, for a couple of reasons, to allow the, the board chair or, or the board president to engage fully in a conversation and also to be worried only about the process. I don't own the content, I own the process. It's my job to make sure the meeting runs um, runs well. And, and the comment about my last comment about denial wasn't just a, a intended as a joke. People do deny reality, um, and and they there are warning signs that they just ignore, um, be either because they're afraid to they're going to jinx it if they met, if they ask a question about it, um, or because they're embarrassed by it. Could be any number of reasons. If you're not in crisis, I mean, I think it's. I think it's healthy every so often, you know, whether it's every five years, every 10 years, whatever it is, for a board of directors to ask itself the question, why are we still here? Um, and, and there may be good, very good reasons, um, but sometimes what I've found when I've been asked to, to facilitate one of these conversations is I find a couple of people who are going to be in the meeting and say, you're the devil's advocates. You are the ones who are going to argue that this organization should be shut down because I don't want you to get into group think. I want you to fully think about all of the issues and all of the arguments and then make a decision. Uh, and that sometimes worked well for us. But um, again, to reiterate, if you ignore a crisis, you are only going to make matters worse. The crisis is not going to go away on its own. Um, so if you're in a financial crisis um, and, and both the workbook and the comments of Susan and Craig today have given you some warning signs, deal with it fast uh, and deal with it appropriately. If you've got more time, 
then have those conversations. And again, I go back to when I, as a funder, when I see budget statements or, or project funding requests, one of my first questions will be, what assumptions are these numbers based on? Uh, because if I can demolish the assumptions, then the document is of little value to me. Susan? I no, I agree. I don't think there's a lot. I think that the the critical you could there's time for, you know, those philosophical thoughts once you get everything else organized and back into something. But you you really have to you have to bring the right people to the table and and do the right thinking at the time you have the issue. I think that that's really important. So, Andrew, I see we have a couple of I think we have a couple of questions you want us to. We, we, we do. And um, the, the, the first question, maybe, maybe Susan, this is one for you. Can a charity who has paid all its debts then sell the building it operates from, assuming that the building was, was purchased with donor funds? Um, yes, I would say yes. And the donor, when a donor contributes to a charity, they're making a gift, which is supposed to be a voluntary transfer of property for no consideration. Um, there may be a gift agreement where there were some commitments to donors. Um, sadly, that's one of the reasons why we we like to work on gift, or I shouldn't say sadly, but it's one of the reasons we like to work on gift agreements. So there isn't some argument that there's some kind of um, constructive trust around the funds that the funds then have to go to another charity for the same purpose or something similar. But generally, yes, the charity should be able to sell the building if you're not going to continue. Um, and and you but you can then use that built that that asset for whatever um, your purpose is or you can grant it to another qualified donee. If you've got a gift agreement that somehow ties it up, then we might have to think about is there any kind of cypre or is there any kind of claim that a, a donor could make that you're misusing or the asset or the funds, but generally that would not, it would not be expected that the donor could tie, tie up the assets of the charity. Andrew, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. You're welcome to. No, I, I, I agree with, with your comment, obviously, in, in terms of what would generally be the case and, yeah. and, and keeping in mind the caveat of, of looking at whatever gift agreement or whatever terms attached to the funds when they were provided to the charity, because that's what's going to indicate whether there are particular constraints or, or issues that the charity is going to need to think about in terms of using the building, selling the building, using the proceeds, et cetera. Yeah. Let me, as the token non-lawyer, let me say, don't do this on your own if you <laughs> That's true. agreements. Yeah. Um, and, and the same thing, I mean, reemphasizing, I mean, I'm not, I'm not in the habit of, of shilling for law firms, um, but I've seen charities and directors get themselves into a mess of trouble because they've tried to be their own lawyers when they don't understand the issues. Um, and, and, you know, if, you, if you're going to sell a million dollar building, then spend a couple of hundred dollars and, and have the conversation with the lawyer. And for God's sake, please, if you're a registered charity, have the conversation with a lawyer who knows something about charity law. <laughs> um, I, I wander into meetings where somebody says, well, we heard from our lawyer that a, that such and such. And I say, well, um, you know, CRA has a policy on that. And they said, oh, it doesn't, this lawyer said it didn't matter. And then I find out the lawyer is a real estate lawyer, which is <laughs> real estate lawyers, but charity lawyers don't practice real estate law. And real estate lawyers should not practice charity law. There <laughs> are different rules and different considerations. So yeah. whether it's insolvency, selling a building, or general operating agreement, like if you're a charity that gets sued, talk to your lawyer. And if you don't have a lawyer, phone somebody who knows a charity lawyer. <laughs> End of rant. We love your rants. Indeed. Um, so an another question, and this is maybe a, a Susan and Craig question, the options that have been, that are outlined in the guidebook, um, the question is, are all these options available to all organizations regardless of legal structure? For example, are there options that are not available to registered charities that might be available to organizations that are not registered charities? 
I, I guess I'll start. I, I think that uh, from an insolvency perspective, I believe, I mean, I'd have to know the specifics of the question perhaps, but uh, I, the bankruptcy regime should be available to any type of corporation, uh, not for profit or, or for profit, uh, and charities as well have uh, taken uh, refuge under the insolvency legislation. So uh, I think that uh, almost everything we've discussed could be available, but again, it's going to be uh, subject to the particularities of your situation. Yeah, and I think I think that's right. I, I agree, Craig. And I think I, I may have seen a quick quickly in the chat, but um, I haven't been focusing on it. But I think you're right. And I think um, because insolvency is federal law, it actually um, it, and it seems to trump a lot. Like there's a question about restricted funds and on an, on a bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. Are there concerns about the restricted funds being used to access other creditors, um, and I think the question wasn't quite there, but I, but my understanding from my insolvency group at Miller Thompson is, once you're into those informal proceedings, the court can access those funds and they can access them in ways that, that may not um, respect the constraints around them, but that once you're yeah. in the statutory regime, that, that, that actually it will trump the other um, restrictions. I think that if you're an organization that has financial issues and cash flow issues, and you do have formally restricted funds and endowments, um, and you're thinking of trying to tap into those, borrowing against them to, to satisfy your liabilities, you'll want to be careful because while the formal insolvency regimes allow you to do that and to perhaps um, break sort of the trust conditions that are placed on those funds from a common law perspective, that isn't the case. You can't decide to do that yourself generally. There's either a, a need to go to court to get approval of that, or you need to do some other process. Like you, you really, as Bob said, you should get advice. You know, this is another example of a situation where getting the appropriate advice. In Ontario, the, um, the public guardian trustee did come out with some rules about when you could access funds if you're in financial difficulty at the beginning of COVID, but they were very limited. Like they're, they're there and it's good, but you really did have to be in financial difficulty to get at it. And again, so, but, and they were quite particular. So if you were going to try to look to your endowment to help you through a financial situation, um, you really need to get the right advice as to whether you can do it and, and whether or not, or whether or not you'll fall into a situation where someone can either argue you've had a breach of trust, which could expose the organization to other issues or claims or liabilities. So it is, it is a tricky area, particularly when you get into donor restricted funds. Absolutely. We would always consult uh, with someone like you, Susan, in those circumstances because of the, the very intricacies of uh, uh, charity law and so on. Yeah. But they generally the rules apply across the board. Mm -hmm. And there's, yeah, and, and I think that that answer sort of addresses um, the last question that we have in, in the chat, which is about you know, externally restricted funds that have been used on operations as a result of, of financial difficulties. And there's an additional question about communications with, with the donors, whether that's, you know, required or, or appropriate in that circumstance. Well, and, and communicating with your donors with, is definitely appropriate. Um, but I think even before that, you should try to, uh, you should get input as to whether what you're proposing is possible. Some of I more and more we see um, charities raising money with donor agreements that provide for amendment clauses, so that they you know they say they want the money to go to a particular purpose, but they actually uh, include right at the right up front a provision that says the donor and the charity can agree to have something different to do something different with the funds. In that case, I think you have a, a good, you know, and again, it always depends, but there's some good thoughts around um, a, a good support for making a change if the donor agrees to it um, and if it's something that's that's documented, but you have to be careful there. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and I would just I would just add to that. Um, certainly if, if the if the you know the gift agreement provides for amendment upon agreement with the donor then that that gives you um, some additional flexibility which can be very valuable but a caution um, goes out to charities that 
if that's not in the gift agreement, there's a there's a, a misconception that can that can go around that all you need to do is talk to your donor and provide that your donor is in agreement. That's good enough. Yeah, and that's cool. not necessarily the case. Once those right. funds are given, unless those the gift agreement has the flexibility mm-hmm. built into it, then you mean it, you may need to take other steps, such as seeking approval of of a court, or depending on your province, you know, the attorney general or the the public guardian and trustee in Ontario. So, um, again, seeking advice on these issues at the front end is is critical. And if you're dealing with a foundation, my advice is contact the grants officer or the executive director of the foundation involved and have the conversation. Um, what yeah. we saw uh, at the beginning of, um, of COVID, a number of foundations remove the normal restrictions and even reporting requirements they placed on grantees. Whether that will continue in the after times um, is, is a subject of some debate. Um, and I think it will depend on individual foundations. But we've had a number of conversations with grantees over the last 18 months um, and have been able to come to, to arrangements with them. Um, but again, it's not one where I want to find out after you've made the change that you, that you made it, because then we're going to have a different conversation. So there's a further question here. Um, are board members shielded from personal liability should the organization default on payables or debt? What should directors do to protect themselves? And this is maybe, maybe a Susan and, and Craig question. Uh, yeah, I, I can start, Susan. Sure. Uh, yeah. with, with respect to uh, a corporation, uh, that is the reason you incorporate to make sure that the individuals behind that corporation are shielded by this corporate vehicle. Uh, so if, if the debt is an obligation of company X, then it's a debt only of that company. Uh, unless, of course, there's a personal guarantee that was given by a director or any uh, individual associated with the company. Uh, but by and large, if it's a corporate debt, it remains a corporate debt. Uh, and so therefore, it, you don't have to do anything else. Um, the only things that directors need to be concerned about are the things we talked about before, like uh, uh the remittances for employee uh, uh, remittances or uh, HST, things like that. Uh, perhaps uh, liability with respect to employee wages to some extent, uh, but for debts themselves, if it's a company debt, it remains there. And I think, yeah, sorry, Craig, were you going to go on? Nope, I think nope. I think the key is that it's the company debt. We all we often always say to our, our organizations that uh, that, the only time you look beyond that as well is if there's been something inappropriate at the director right. level or something, or somebody Fair does enough. something inappropriate. And I don't think the grant agreements from government would reach the directors, but you just, you know, there are times where there could be, um, there could be penalties under the income tax act. if The board doesn't file its returns and that sort of thing properly. Right. So it's, again, it's just making sure that you're doing the things don't walk away, just make sure you're doing things properly and the directors should be protected. I agree. Okay. 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 I, 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 I don't want to give that. people, sorry. Sorry. Right. I don't want to give people a false sense of security. Right. So, so tell me whether I'm wrong on this. So directors are liable, personally liable, for remittances to CRA yeah. deductions, uh, GST or HST, yeah. in some provinces for workers' compensation payments. Maybe, health tax. Uh, in Alberta, that's, that's the case. Uh, some environmental legislation uh, attaches liability to individuals who serve on boards in certain circumstances. Um, there may be provincial taxes for which directors may assume personal liability. The other piece, and, and you can comment on it, the other piece is if CRA, if charity, if you're a registered charity and the directorate concludes that you should be revoked for uh, some issues, then directors may become ineligible individuals and not eligible to be man- senior managers or directors of other charities. So have I got that about right? Yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think, I think we were, I think 
the last piece is definitely something where we're going sort of the tax return. And then if you are, if you do lose charitable status, cause you've done whatever you're doing inappropriately, that could be a blemish on you as being a director, but it, it shouldn't, um, there shouldn't be personal liability, but Bob's right. It's any, any kind of deemed trust monies that are statutory obligations that are created in the province or federally that say the directors could be personally liable, you would have to be concerned about. Most organizations have directors and officers insurance. That's another thing you want to do to protect yourself is to make sure your organization has kept that in place. That's a good point. Yeah. And I would say it's key to look at your actual contracts. Uh, you know, is it the company that's on that contract, for instance, yeah. uh, and, and not a director who in a hurry agreed to sign an agreement just to get things going? Uh, I've seen that a few times and everyone believed, oh, no, that's the company debt. And it turns out, no, it's the director's name on the contract. So I would have someone carefully review the contracts, too. So I don't see any further questions in the chat. Um, and so maybe it's it's a good time then to uh, to wrap up the session. Um, if there are any further questions that anyone has uh, following the presentation, please do feel free to contact uh, any one of us. Um, uh, our survey is also available. So please, if you if you feel so inclined, take the time to fill it out. We, we very much appreciate your feedback. Um, and otherwise, uh, thank you very much to our to our panelists, not just for talking about these issues, but for preparing this guidebook, which I think is going to be a really valuable resource for you know, organizations that are struggling with these issues or, or having to deal with these issues. So thank you, everyone, for for attending and all the best for the rest of the day and uh, the rest of the year. And we'll see you again soon. Bye for now. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye.